name mrs x age 60 years address raja rajeshwari nagar occupation housemaid education 9 standard married for for 42 years date of admission was to may 20th 2022 date of examination was may 23rd 2022 chief complaint patient presented with mass coming out of her vagina since 6 months and complain of increased frequency of uh, urination since 6 months and pain abdomen since 2 months patient was apparently normal 6 months back when she felt a mass coming out of her vagina insidious in onset and gradually progressive in size the mass is seen only on squ- only in squatting position initially and reduces by and used to reduce by itself on rest which then progress to spontaneous expulsion size of the mass is aggravated on coughing sneezing and lifting heavy objects associated with increased frequency of and urg- urgency of micturition associated with stress and continence history of incomplete evacuation of bladder history of digital repositioning of bladder to pass urine associated with difficulty in day to difficulty in day to day activities no history of burning micturition no history of discharge or bleeding per vagina no history of chronic cough no history of constipation no history of pain during defecation and manual repos- repositioning of mass during defecation or anal incontinence of platelets liquid or solid stool Okay, in all this history, uh, let me. Can I ask a few questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so in this history, uh, you said she is complaining of a vaginal mass um, for six months, and you mentioned that uh, there is no history of uh, discharge or bleeding per vagina. Why have you asked discharge or bleeding per vagina in a mass vaginal mass? What is the relevance of asking that? Ma'am, uh, discharge could say that if there is any infection. Okay, infection where? Uh, in fact, is there any vaginal infection or if there is any uh, urogenital infection? Okay, all right. Okay, and why have you asked for bleeding? Um, bleeding. I'm not sure, ma'am. Bleeding to make sure whether she's um if she's a uh, men post menarche or if she is a rape of reproductive age so you can you know her age is 60 years old so she is probably post menopausal so what are the differential diagnoses of vaginal mass with bleeding so whenever you ask history of presenting illness you basically trying to elicit a a direct question between fibroid yeah and um, right can you just hold on i'm getting a call just a minute Our participants are just coming through now. They will take class into the night of work. Hello, sorry. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, tell me what are the what are what do you think of? So, whenever you take a history, you are trying to the all these are your negative history. You there must be something in your mind when you ask these questions. Ma'am, if so there's a mass and there's bleeding, it could also yeah. be CA cervix. Okay, very good. And um, if in a reproductive age group, you can think of fibroid. Okay, what fibroid kind of fibroid will present the sub mucosa? Well, sorry, I gave the answer. Will present bleeding with a mass. <laughs> I already told it. What what will present with um, what kind of fibroid will present with the just just one second, ma'am. Can you like the question? I mean, can you please uh yeah yeah I'll people. mute yeah I'll mute them, ma'am. Just one second. So the rest of you watching, you can write down the answers in the chat box, whatever we're discussing, or you can write down your doubts in the chat box. Okay, and we'll get to those. Yeah, ma'am, they're muted now. Yeah. Okay, so what kind of fibroid will present with a vaginal mass and bleeding? A uh, a cervical polyp, a cervical fibroid polyp. A cervical fibroid won't present a, with a mass, but a polyp. Yes, so a sub mucosal fibroid, which has become big. and has come outside the os and outside the vagina also so it's called a fibroid polyp 
Okay, that kind of mass can present with bleeding. What else? Are the one more cause of bleeding I want? Mass per vaginum with bleeding. So what are you thinking of in this case? Based on our history, it's pretty straightforward what you should think of. What are you thinking of? Ma'am, in this history, cystocele, ma'am. You're thinking of cystocele or basically a, a uterovaginal Utero prolapse. Yes, prolapse. that is right. You're thinking of a uterovaginal prolapse with a, if it has a decubitus ulcer, okay, or infected, or if the ulcer has become infected, or because of erosion, you that patient may have bleeding or spotting also. Okay, yes, or if there's a malignant change in the ulcer. So these, these are the reasons why you ask for bleeding or vaginal bleeding. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, continue. There's um history of brain abdomen, and she said that the history of brain abdomen is only if the urination is delayed. She said as soon as she passes urine, the pain is relieved. Only yes. if she delays passing the urine, then she experiences a lot of pain. Okay, all right. Obstetric history. Patient has been married for the last 42 years. It's a non-consanguineous marriage. Um, P2L2, her obstetric score. Uh, the first pregnancy, it was spontaneous preg pregnancy. The child, the it resulted in a forty year old. Now it's the child is a forty year old female. Uh, full term normal vaginal delivery. It was performed at a clinic. There was no ANC or PNC complications, and the birth weight was two point eight kgs. Uh, the second pregnancy it was spontaneous pregnancy. Thirty now it's a thirty eight year old male. Full term normal vaginal delivery at a clinic. There were no complications. Um before or after the, during or after the pregnancy and the birth weight was three kgs. Um, there was history of early resumption of physical labor and pure purim, uh, and it was present with both the pregnancies. Menstrual history, menarche at 14 years, menopause at 50 years of age. Prior to menopause, her cycle were 28 plus or minus two days. Uh, she had five days of flow and she used to change about three to four um, three to four cloth, cha cloth changes per day, not associated with dysmenorrhea or passive cloths. Okay, continue. Past history, there's no history of asthma, diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, or any thyroid dysfunction. There's no history of blood transfusion or previous surgical procedures. There's no history of similar such episodes in the past, or similar such complaints of mass per vagina. There's nothing significant in her family history. Personal history, the patient follows a mixed diet. She complained of reduced appetite and also disturbed sleep pattern because of um, increased frequency of menstruation even in the night. Um, disturb bladder movements and normal bowel habits and no addictive habits. General, phys general physical examination. Patient was conscious, cooperated and well-oriented to time, place and person. Patient is moderately built and nourished. Um, she, is 40, she weighs 42 kgs and is about 150 centimeters in height. The BMI is 18.66. Her BP was 130 on 80 millimeters of mercury. Her pulse rate was 64 beats per minute. Respiratory rate, 14 cycles per minute. She was afebrile during uh, examination and her signs of pickle were absent. Systemic examination, um, CVS, S1 and S2 sounds were heard, no murmur. Respiratory system, the chest was normal in shape, size and symmetry, normal, uh, bilateral normal respiratory Normal vascular breath sounds were heard and no, there were no added sounds. CNS, no focal neurological deficits. Per abdomen, um, upon inspection, it was normal in shape. There was no distension. All the quadrants moved equally with respiration. Umbilicus was centered in position. There's no scars, sinuses, dilated uh, vessels or visible pulsations. Palpation, the abdomen was soft. Um, palpation was done like after emptying of the bladder, ma'am. So at that time, it was soft, non-tender. There was no organomegaly and also there was no local rise in temperature. All right. Local examination, her pubic hair was sparse. Labia and min uh, majora and minora were normal. Pink uh, seen. Um, 
pink uh, pink globular mass protruding out of her introitus which appears to bulge on straining uh, the prolapsed portion was seen protruding 5 cm from the introitus uh, could be a third degree uterovaginal descent okay. leakage of urine was observed when patient was asked to cough there was okay. no decubitus ulcer seen there was no bleeding observed no vaginal discharge and no scars okay so did you did you if you not mentioned whether the cervix was seen or not could you see the cervix um i just think globular mass so why am i asking this question and did you see the cervix ma'am um, i did not notice the cervix no. because yeah, um, okay we d- i didn't do speculum per speculum examination i understand but the mass was outside so if you could did you lift the mass and see whether you could see the cervix no no ma'am okay all right that's so i didn't even it's a okay all right so you didn't, because, didn't even didn't perform do. thumb test or anything that's all like there was okay, no you just did a local examination understood yeah. okay okay so why am i asking this then why did why am i asking if you saw a cervix uh ma'am if you see the ma'am if you see the cervix you can um, easily make out if it's which um the anterior vaginal wall or the posterior yes. vaginal wall so if you see the cervix you know it's a third degree uterine prolapse that means the uterus along with the anterior vaginal wall not only has the bladder prolapsed but also the uterus has also prolapsed it also helps in differentiate from rarer things like a chronic inverted uterus uterine inversion which is chronic which is also a differential of vagina of prolapse where you won't see the cervix the uterus has turned inside out okay where there's a prolapse the whole thing just comes down right so yes, a sir. cervix will be seen in uterine prolapse it won't be seen in a inverted chronic inversion but uh, uh, it it also won't be seen when it's just an anterior vaginal wall prolapse or a posterior vaginal wall prolapse not a uterine prolapse so yes, your sir. what your describing looks like what a uterovaginal prolapse not why you saying uterovaginal the cervix you wouldn't see but just just based on local examination which part of the uh um a pelvis has prolapsed is it the bladder is it the uterus is it the rectum from just examination ma'am then yeah. from this examination we can make out the uterus because for you said you can't see the cervix it's a third ma'am. degree what you can see from here you it is probably a third degree cystocele what i'm understanding from your examination okay and you've not done a per speculum so you've not seen the cervix the cervix is still inside the introitus if at all okay and it probably hasn't prolapsed out unless you do a speculum you are not able to see the cervix am i correct yes ma'am and we also didn't do a per rectal examination to okay all right so all this okay so do you do you have any more slides left so we can go to the discussion ma'am um okay continue Mrs X a 60 year old female presented with mass per vagina abdominal pain and increased frequency of urination as third degree uterovaginal prolapse with cystocele so uh, this is your provisional diagnosis okay so uh, uh, basically the next question which would come from the examiner is what would you want to do next ma'am because she is a 60 year old female um and um, she she does not she has finished uh, family planning she does not want of uh, okay i put it in a simpler way if you are a post graduate what would you want to do next ma'am we do a, an ultrasound so to confirm before our... that before that you said you've not done this you've not done that so you would want ma'am, to we do can, we can do a per speculum and yes, a per vaginal yes, examination yes you have to do a per speculum a per vaginal and a per rectal examination per tell rectal me examination. tell me each examination why you want to do why do you want to do a per speculum examination from per uh, speculum examination at this point we can make out we can see the cervix and we can make out from where the if it's a cystocele it should be coming from the anterior vaginal wall if it's a okay. um, urethrocele from the lower one third of the anterior vaginal wall if okay. it's a okay. rectocele the mass will be protruding from the posterior vaginal wall so okay. we can differentiate so whenever a, so basically when you have a a, a prolapse a uterovaginal prolapse is a very broad term okay so it basically means prolapse of the vaginal wall and along with it its associated relationships right so the okay. anterior vaginal wall as you said it could be your, prolapse of the urethra prolapse of the bladder when we talk about the uterus it could be prolapse of the uterus if we talk about the posterior vaginal wall it could be prolapse of the 
upper part, which is called an enterocele, okay, or the lower part, which is called a retrocele. So to determine which part has prolapsed out, we need to do a per speculum examination. That will give us a better idea. Okay, now can you describe how will you uh, uh, do a per specular examination in this patient? Which speculum will you use? I'm not sure about how to perform a per speculum. Okay, okay. so we'll go step by step. Which speculum will you use? And what are the two types of speculum that, that you know of? Of vaginal speculums. So it's not very basic because prolapse is a topic which I feel many, especially undergraduates, get um, uh, confused with. Uh, uh, probably you don't see it that often, okay? But uh, it's actually, if, if you see uh, uh, a prolapse, it becomes very easy to understand. Okay, so what uh, what are the two speculums we use? Um, um, Tanvi has written, right, Sims and Cuspo speculum. Have you seen a Sims speculum, how it looks like? Okay, if you've but not seen see them perform the uh, the the exam, have, you, have you seen a sim speculum and have you seen a cuspo speculum? Ma, I don't know the name, so I don't know which. Okay, is... so so go back to my uh, after this session. I want to go back to my um, uh, YouTube channel, OBG classes by Dr. Rena, and you'll find uh, in the playlist. Go to instruments. You'll find sim speculum and you'll find cusco speculum. And I've shown you how they look. Or you can check on my instrument session on the White Army. You can find the sim speculum and the cusco speculum right in the beginning. Okay, so there are two types of spe speculum. One is a sims which has two blades. Okay, so it, it looks like this. Okay, and a cusco which is round. So a sim speculum is the one which we use to examine a prolapse. Okay, yes. so a cusco speculum, if you use, it will obscure all the vaginal walls. Okay, so this question can come in the viva. Which speculum will you use to examine a prolapse? Cusco speculum is, is completely circular. So when you open it up, you, you the, the entire, all the, the, the blades will cover the vagina. You can't determine prolapse based on a cusco speculum. A sim speculum you will insert it in the posterior vaginal wall and you'll ask the patient to strain and you'll see the extent of the prolapse of the anterior vaginal wall. And similarly, to see the extent of the posterior vaginal wall, you gradually withdraw the sim speculum and you see where the bulge is. It is in, is it in the upper part or the lower part. That will help you determine whether it's an enterocele or a rectocele. So remember, yes, a sim speculum is what we use when we do a speculum examination, okay? To see how it looks like, go back and check my videos, you will find out, okay? So that is the first thing you will do, speculum examination. You will also see if there's any, any keratinization or any ulcer, okay, or any lesion on the cervix or any part of the vagina. Why is that important? Why is looking for a decubitus ulcer important? What is a decubitus ulcer? Mama, a decubitus ulcer, it, because of the venous congestion see, uh, caused by the prolapse, there could be a decubitus ulcer, ma'am. And okay. uh, without, and it's important for the management because without co correcting the ulcer, you cannot uh, do surgery. Okay, why can't we do surgery? Because there could be uh, malignant you, transfer. There's an ulcer sitting there. You're anyway going to do a vaginal hysterectomy probably for this patient. It will get removed. Tanvi, why can't we operate? Well, is it because of malignant transformation? That is in a non-healing ulcer. Okay, but a simple decubitus ulcer, which is not malignant, why don't we operate in the presence of a decubitus ulcer? Anyone? Um, just one second. I'll um, uh, enable Tanvi, ma'am, to unmute. She's answering on the um, chat box also. Yeah, Anya Tanvi also. Let her join the discussion. This is Tanvi is a postgraduate with us and she's joined. Uh, the rest uh, can answer in the chat box. If Tanvi wants to join the discussion, she can join. Okay, so uh, Tanvi has done secondary infection. Yes, secondary infection could be a possibility, but decubitus ulcer, remember, is not an infected ulcer. The patient will say ki, I have that there's an ulcer there. You, what, what is the harm in operating on me? And the ulcer will go off with the remaining tissue. Why won't you operate? Because of the risk of bleeding. Okay, so if you have a decubitus ulcer, there is venous congestion. So it can bleed profusely during surgery. Okay, and the planes also get distorted. So when you're trying to dissect the bladder or the posterior vaginal wall during surgery, 
the planes get distorted and it becomes difficult to um, uh, operate. Okay, so that's one reason. So how do you treat this ulcer? The patient says, suppose the patient has an ulcer, you tell her we need to treat the ulcer, then we'll operate. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, you have to do a packing that has acriflavin and glycerine twice a day, once okay. uh, in the night and once after she wakes up and finishes her regular routine. Okay, so basically you have to reduce the ulcer. If the ulcer is reduced, okay, using you can use Maxab, you can use glycerin, you can use acriflavin. But the main aim is to keep a tampon and keep the ulcer reduced. Once the ulcer is reduced, there won't be venous congestion and the ulcer will heal. So Suhail is asking, ma'am, please explain about pop Q system. Okay, so Suhail, this will be very difficult to explain my hands. I don't have any written material. So just wait for a few days. I will post it, put it on the channel and I'll send it to Nandini also. She can post the video on your channel also okay so um uh, we understand can I start the explaining what i know uh, well, okay try to tell me what you know pop -Q, about pop -Q. what is pop -Q system and what is the um, earlier classification also tell us both the earlier classification was the shaw's classification ma'am yeah and uh, the recent cross classification is the pop -Q classification which is a pelvic organ prolapse quantification okay good uh ma'am basically here you use the hymen as a reference point Okay. So if you see the prolapse either one centimeter above or one centimeter below the hymen, then it's called a second degree prolapse. Okay. If you see the prolapse uh, uh, about like above like three centimeters or uh, more than one centimeter above like above the hymen, um, then it is a first degree prolapse. If it is uh, more than two one centimeter or uh, equal to one centimeter or more than one centimeter centimeter below the hymen, then it is a third degree prolapse. Okay, so basically, pop -Q is uh, is basically a system which has uh, uh, it is more of a what do you say it is more of a quanti quantitative analysis of the prolapse so that it becomes easy to compare notes um, uh, and it is easy to document. Uh, it is not very easy to do though. Uh, so uh, it has nine points basically. Okay, three measurements and six points. Okay, it's in, in a grid system it is made. Okay, and I will try to explain this to you better in a video, in a separate video. Okay, but basically it it is the newest classification and though it although it is a little bit cumbersome, it helps differentiate or helps me explain a, 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 about a patient sitting uh, if someone sends me the records of the patient with the nine points in the grid, I and I, I form an image in my mind, it becomes much easier to understand. But I'll try to make a video about this and try to explain it much clearer, hopefully with a patient also, if I can get a patient and I'll make the video of how it is actually done, how the point, what is point AA, what is point BB, what is BA, what is point C, D, TVL, perineal body, all those. So this is more for postgraduate learning Okay, as an undergraduate, what you need to know is basically uh, Shaw's classification is still valid. Can you tell us about that, Nandini? What is the Shaw classification? How is that done? Ma'am, I'm not really sure, but if it's a normal, uh, normally the cervix lies at the level of the ischial spine. So in first degree, there'll be descent of cervix into the vagina below the ischial, in ischial spine in second yes. degree. Uh, descent of the cervix um, up it's up to but within the introitus in third right. degree it is the descent of the cervix will be outside the introitus yes. and fourth degree is also called as procedentia where there's complete descent of anterior posterior and apical okay. part of the okay. yeah Okay, so Suhail, you're right. So Hale, you're right. Yes, you can get pop -Q in your theory exam as an undergraduate, but in the practical exam, you're not expected to do a pop -Q. Okay, for undergraduates, this is not for postgraduates. Okay, so um, uh, then, uh, Nandini, you're right. You have to do. Uh, uh, so how do you differentiate between a third degree and a fourth degree? When you look at a third degree and you look at a fourth degree, both look the same. But you have to do the thumb test, ma'am, in process. Very good. Thumb degree. finger test. Yes, okay, so thumb, thumb, finger test. Many uh, students don't understand this test. What is basically done is you go as high up the prolapse as is seen, okay, outside the introitus and try to approximate your thumb and finger at the top point of the prolapse. If your finger and thumb approximate, what does that mean? 
It means it's a fourth degree prolapse. Yes, it means it's a procedure. That means the whole uterus is below your two fingers. Okay, the whole uterus, the whole the fund, you're going above the fundus. That's why you're able to approximate your fingers. That's why it's a fourth degree or a procedure. Whereas if it's a third degree prolapse, the fundus is still above my thumb and finger. So I'm not able to approximate my fingers. Then it is a third degree prolapse. This question is very important in your practical exam. Okay. Ma'am, I had so, another doubt. The per yeah. vaginal examination, other than to test the tone of the perineal body, why do we do it? So a per vaginal examination will help you determine several things. Okay, anyone wants to answer this? Why do we do a PV examination and prolapse? Or a bimanual examination? Ma'am, I know one cause it is to look for the tone of the levator ani. Yeah, right, you're right. The tone of the levator ani, very good. You also do a bimanual examination to determine the size of the uterus. Okay. okay, the size of the uterus, the uterus might be enlarged. She may have a fibroid, she may have adenomyosis, she may have another pro any other pathology in the uterus causing it causing its enlargement. Yes, then the mobility to see whether there's if, if the uterus is adherent to any other structure, the mobility may be restricted because you're eventually going to plan surgery for this patient or in ever whoever you're planning surgery for, you need to know the size of the uterus, the mobility, and if there's any adnexal mass. Okay, so an adnexal mass means an ovarian mass if may be associated that may change your plan of surgery completely. Okay, or your route of surgery completely. So it depends on so a bimanual examination will give you other additional information. Of course, you can get this information by doing an ultrasound, but clinically also first you need to examine the patient completely. Okay, so some there, okay, now I'm getting some answers here. Uh, Tanvi says mobility. So here it says incontinence. So incontinence is not uh, on bimanual examination, but you're right. And she mentioned also, Nandani, that yes, you have to look for stress urinary incontinence because SUI is very commonly associated with, uh, prolapse. with prolapse. And you so, have to plan the management also. You can't ignore the SUI. She may not have complained. Many women don't complain of SUI. They're very embarrassed. But prolapse cystocele is a risk factor. So many times correcting the cystocele will will but in this will correct the SUI, ma'am. Will correct the yes. So what will what will you do? So you you will I mean this patient we had done the checking for that in local how examination. You, how did you check? Uh, you you asked her to cough? Uh, without, uh, yes, I'm without before uh, emptying the bladder, uh, we ah, yes. reduced the swelling and then asked yes. her to cough, asked her to cough, and then and there was leakage. So, so how so how do you know your repair will help this patient? Will help in will help um um the in uh, the incontinence. So she has SUI. So you have to treat this also. And what is the treatment of SUI? Uh, SUI. Ma'am, basically the SUI is because the bladder neck is present in the pelvic, um, in in the pelvis instead of in the abdomen. Okay. So because of increased abdomen, even with mild increased abdominal abdominal there pressure, there will be gone. leakage. So how so, do you know? So what will you do to correct it? No, we have to remove the strain that the uterus is putting on the bladder. So we have um, to basically correct the so whatever prolapse there is, we have to correct it. We will have to do a surgical correction. Okay, we'll have to do a pelvic floor repair and we have to do a cystocele repair. Okay, so all that will help the stress urinary incontinence also. But additionally, we also do what is called a Bonnie's test. What is a Bonnie's test? Anyone tell me, Tanvi, what is Bonnie's test? A patient with SUI, how will you know she will benefit from surgery? Okay, this is homework. Okay, what is Bonnie Bonnie's test and how will you correct stress urinary incontinence in this patient? Okay, we're moving away from the discussion. Let's get back to the prolapse. Okay, so this patient, you have said that, uh, okay, so we are in bimanual examination. We've seen the size of the uterus, we've seen the mobility, we've seen the levator ni, we've seen the position anti or retro we've seen the furnaces. And yes, so here is that we see, so anal sphincter tone, has to be assessed, but that is not assessed by manual, by manual examination. That is an assessed by doing a per rectal examination. Okay, so this is the, this will complete your examination. Now, next, what will you want to do? Ma'am, after com completing the examination, we can do an ultrasound to 
um, see if there is any uh, and retroflexion of the retroversion of the uterus. Okay, Tanvi is right. Bonnie's test very good. Okay. Um, uh, you, uh, what will the ultrasound tell you? Retroflexion, what else will it tell you? Why are we doing an ultrasound? Is there any use, for, use of an ultrasound? And if there is, what exactly are we looking for? The ultrasound won't help us confirm our diagnosis because the diagnosis is very obvious. You've seen Some it will show labs. us if the cervix is of normal length or if there's an increase in uterus. Um, if if the uterus cervical length is increased, so we that can... That also you can do based on, on clinical examination. You put a uterine sound and you can measure the cervical length. So an ultrasound will basically just tell you the uterus, the size of the uterus, whether there's any adnexal mass. Okay, and if she has postmenopausal bleeding, suppose, then you can see the endometrial thickness. But additionally, yes. a woman who has long-standing chronic prolapse, okay, for many, many years, what do they tend to have? What additional ultrasound, what, or what additional structure in the abdomen do you want to see? In the intestine? No. Long standing prolapse, it's causing long standing cystocele. Oh, the you bladder you would want to yes, see? The, the, the more, uh, above the bladder. Above the bladder. What, what, is, what is above the bladder? So you're right, the bladder, they stretch on the bladder. So there is a tendency for. The ureters to get obstructed, so they will be hydro a congestion of the hydro hydro nephrosis, and that will lead to gradually hydro nephrosis. So, a long usually long standing prolapses, we will commonly see hydro nephrosis, and that needs to be documented prior to surgery. Okay, so this patient, what do you want to do now? She she's sixty years old. She's come with a third degree stage, is a third degree utero. With vaginal prolapse. Okay, say she has a cystocele, she has a third degree uterine prolapse, and she has a rectocele. What do you want to do? Uh, Ma'am, because she doesn't have any comorbidities, it is safe to give general anesthesia in this patient. What, what do you want to do? Yeah, anesthesia so, secondary, it's yeah. not an anesthesia exam. Just, uh, uh, observe Ma'am, we, uh, we do a ward me or hysterectomy with the pelvic. That's so a, what is that? a vaginal hysterectomy with a pelvic floor repair. Okay, so vaginal hysterectomy, tell me what this means. What is a vaginal hysterectomy? What will that, what problem will that solve? And what is a pelvic floor repair? Ma'am, in a pelvic floor repair, you'll be, uh, the, you'll be uh, treating the cystocele and also you'll be preventing a rectocele. So you can, there'll be anterior col colporaphy for a cystocele. Okay. And to prevent a, um, uh, and if there is a rectocele, then we'll be doing posterior colpo perineo raffi, but in this patient, it's not there. So if, since it's a third degree prolapse, we'll do, be doing vaginal hyst hysterectomy, ma'am. Okay, so in this patient, we'll do, okay, so I gave the scenario of a uterine prolapse with a cystocele and a rectocele. So you will basically do what you said is a pelvic floor repair with a hysterectomy. So basically, you are going to correct the defects. Wherever there is a defect, you will try to correct it. Okay, so yes, the primary organ involved is the uterus. The uterus has descended down, so you will do a vaginal hysterectomy. You obviously won't do an abdominal hysterectomy because the uterus is prolapsed outside. Okay, yes, you will also do a anterior as you said a repair of the cystocele that means you will reduce the bladder okay and you will create a shelf above it with the fascia so that it doesn't come down again and you will do a, similarly will reduce the rectocele and you will put stitches over stitch the fascia over it so it doesn't prolapse out again okay so this is what you will do this is called a what you write is ward mayo's operation which is a, a, a vaginal hysterectomy with a and the and a posterior corporeal Now, uh, wait. Before we go further, Suhail is asking, ma'am. First, we should confirm what structure is in question. Depending on that, we can go for management. Agreed. So, depending on what, so as I said, if uh, we are giving the example of a cystocele with a uterus uterine prolapse with a rectocele, if it was only a cystocele, we would have done a cystocele repair. If it was only a rectocele, we would have done a rectocele repair. Ma'am, so we have we not done a. I didn't do a per rectal uh, examination or anything in this patient okay. to see. Okay. It's all right. So then, ma'am, can we go for conservative management of this patient? Okay, what is your answer, Anthony, to this patient? Ma'am, conservative uh, management is only, um, it's only um, advised for first degree prolapse or if in, if in a pregnant woman. 
Suppose this patient says, I don't want surgery, what will you do? Now, if in case the patient says that refuses to do uh, surgery, then you can give a pessary, ma'am, a gallon to yes. the donor. Okay. So what pessary do we use? Uh, a gallon. A gallon pessary. Okay, more, more commonly, what do we use? We more commonly use a donut ring, pessary. A ring pessary. A ring pessary. Okay. Yes. Just. Sorry, I sorry. have to take the call. I'm really sorry. Apologies. So, um, um, so what? Where were we? Ring pessary. Yeah, ring pessary, ma'am. So, uh, so ring pessary is uh, indicated in women who don't want surgery, or women who want to prolong surgery, or women who have a decubitus ulcer. Okay, or they are not fit for surgery. In such women, we will advise a ring pessary. Okay, so otherwise there is not much role for conservative management in this woman. Okay, um, now uh, coming to the surgical part of this, I want uh, one of you, any one of you uh, to tell me the steps of a vaginal hysterectomy. Can we, can we start with you? Uh, I know the okay. order of clamping. Uh, other than that, I don't know the steps. Okay, tell me the order of clamping then. Ma'am, in a vaginal hysterectomy, the order of clamping would be the uterosacral ligament first, then the cardinal ligament, then the yes. uterine artery, yes. then the fibro ovarian ligament. Yes, very good. Okay, so that's the order. But so basically, uh, what what we need to do when we have, okay, so so uh, when I have a prolapse, I have a cystocele, okay, with a uterine prolapse, with a rectocele. Okay, so suppose I just cut it like this. Can you tell me the layers that will come? Um, can you please repeat the question, ma'am? I have a prolapse. Okay, I have a prolapse, a patient with a prolapse. Okay, and I just cut the prolapse like this. <coughs> she has a cystocele, she has a rectocele, she has a uterus coming out. What are the layers that are cut? Starting from the top to the bottom, can you tell me layer wise what I'm cutting? So, what is the first thing on top that I'm cutting? If you, if, if you see the different layers, because you need to know the layers to understand the surgery. Anvi, can you answer? I'm cutting the prolapse like this. Um, you'll be cutting the uterus first. 
no no first what is on top uterus will come much below what is on top on top would be the anterior vaginal wall see the prolapse has come out so the anterior vaginal wall has come out that pink structure the pink globular structure which you are seeing is the anterior vaginal the vagina so it's the vagina which has come out okay it's prolapsed out the vagina has prolapsed out the vagina along with it has brought all the other structures with it so on top is vagina below is vagina you have anterior vaginal wall on top below that what do you have okay not peritoneum okay uh, just below the anterior vaginal wall you will have the what is the next structure it's a cystocele so what should the next structure be the bladder the, the bladder very bladder. good so so you'll have the anterior vaginal wall you will have the bladder in between what is the fascia this is the endocrine vaginal fascia so you have the anterior vaginal wall you have the vesico vaginal fascia then you have the bladder am i right yes ma'am what is the next structure after bladder what is there what else has prolapsed out the uterus the cervix the, the cervix and the uterus right so so you have the anterior vaginal wall the vesico vaginal fascia the bladder then the cervix and the uterus in, in between the bladder and the cervix what tissue do you have what fascia do you have you have the vesico cervical fascia okay just see the structures you have the you have the bladder on top and the cervix close you in between you have the vesico cervical fascia is this getting too confusing or you understanding can you so repeat have, it ma'am so we have the anterior vaginal wall on top then we have the bladder in between we have the vesico vaginal mm. fascia okay is that yes, clear yes ma'am then below that you have the cervix the bladder comes then the cervix come in between you have the vesico cervical fascia right yes ma'am then below the cervix what do you have you have the uterus you have The cervix, the uterus will be above the cervix. I'm talking. You're cutting. You're cut, cutting the structure straight. I'm saying one out, one after the other. Okay, you have the bladder, then you have the cervix, and then you have the rectum. And in between the rectum and the uh, uh, uterus, you have this empty space of the pouch of Douglas, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and below the rectum, what do you have? You now have the posterior vaginal wall, and in between the peep, the posterior vaginal wall and the rectum you have the recto vaginal fascia okay so i think everybody is getting confused okay um so basically what i'm trying to say is i'm 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 just trying to you to imagine cutting the layers okay because you need to know when you are dissecting okay so the structures which you clamp cut and like it from below upwards you you told correctly but to reach those structures you also have to dissect what is anterior and what is posterior is that part clear yes ma'am okay so if we dissect what is anterior what is posterior then only we can also access the lateral parts if it's not only about lateral ligament clamping cutting and ligating we also have to clear the the you have to be very carefully while we are dissecting the bladder okay then the so what we do is we basically first dissect the anterior vaginal wall of the bladder then we dissect the bladder of the cervix and the uterus and same behind the uterus we have to dissect the bladder the posterior vaginal wall of the rectum so each layer has to be separated in order to advance for the surgery okay so we have to separately dissect all the layers okay that means dissect the bladder of the uterus so that you don't end up inadvertently injuring the bladder when you when doing your surgery so we dissect the bladder of the uterus anteriorly and posteriorly there is really nothing there there's a pouch of douglas which is an empty space so we open the pouch of douglas and then we go laterally what you were saying okay yes, the uterosacral the cardinal the uterine arteries and then the tubo bedin complex okay so once we have removed the uterus then come we come to the repairs the repairs means the cystocele and the rectocele so yes, the cystocele so what i was saying is you have the anterior vaginal wall then you have the bladder so you have to separate the anterior vaginal wall of the bladder okay so once you remove once you dissect off that layer the bladder goes inside and then you close the vesico vaginal fascia so it acts like a support to the 
bladder. Okay, that is a cystocele repair. Similarly, in a rectocele repair, you dissect the posterior vaginal wall of the rectum, reduce the rectum, and then close the rectovaginal fascia. Okay, so that is a posterior colpoperineography. Okay, so Sahil is saying your understanding. Very good, okay? Because it, it's a little difficult to understand. I remember as an undergraduate, I never understood all this. Okay, when I became a first-year PG, my professor asked me the same question as a first-year PG. When you cut the layers, what will you see? And I was very confused. What is she saying? <laughs> and then I gradually understood. So once you understand this concept, everything became very clear to me. Okay, that this is what we're doing. So we are first dissecting the bladder of the uterus. We are opening the pouch of Douglas. We are going up, removing the uterus. Then we're dissecting the anterior channel wall of the bladder. And we're closing the psychovaginal fascia so that the bladder stays up. And similarly, we are dissecting the rectum of the posterior vaginal wall and we are closing the rectovaginal fascia so that the rectum stays down, stays up. Okay, so that's what is a VH vaginal hysterectomy with a pelvic floor repair. Okay, so if someone asks you the steps, Nandini, you're right. That is the order of which we clamp. But also in addition, say you have to dissect the bladder of these, the uterus anteriorly and posteriorly, you have to open the pouch of Douglas. Douglas because yes. unless you access the peritoneum, you can't keep clapping and cutting. You In an abdominal hysterectomy, you open and you enter the peritoneum. But from below, yes. how will you enter the peritoneum? By dissecting the bladder off, so you enter the UV fold. And posteriorly, by opening up the posterior channel wall, you will enter the pouch of Douglas directly. That's an empty yes. space. Okay, once you enter the peritoneum, your job becomes much easier okay so that's the steps of a vh with a pelvic floor repair okay they will ask you very very simple questions as an undergraduate in the exam don't worry much about uh, prolapse it's a very straightforward case there are only a limited number of questions that can come unlike aup or fibroid where they can go anywhere yes pop q is important for postgraduates as undergraduates you just need to know the name of the nine points not how to do it Okay, but you need to know for your theory exams the name of the nine points and then what are the advantages of a POP-Q system. I will try to bring out a video on this very soon. Okay, it's a very good topic to make a short video. Yes, ma'am. Secondly, secondly, you need to know um, uh, the risk factors for a prolapse. I think Andy mentioned these initially. Risk factors for prolapse are important. Differential diagnosis for prolapse are very important. What are the differential diagnosis? So we discussed a few. I think we discussed fibroid polyp. We discussed cancer cervix or a growth on the vulva or vagina or the cervix. Okay, what are the other? We discussed chronic inversion okay, of the uterus. These are the other differential diagnoses of a, a prolapse. Uh, any, am I missing anything? Um, like the way I had learned was the differential diagnosis, you differentiated like what are the differences for mass descending per vagina and then yeah. what are the differences yeah. for, for so mass descending? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, same thing. What are the differential diagnoses for mass per vagina? Uh, ma'am, a vulval cyst or a vaginal cyst. Very good. Uh, um, congena if there's an elongation of cervix. Of the congena cervix, congena good. Yes, I um, missed these, right? Uh, uh, urethral diverticula. Okay, good. Uh, Gartner cyst, good. That's a vaginal cyst. She's mentioned and, that. And, and the fibroid polyp. Yes, right. And rarely a chronic inversion of the uterus. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, so these um, are the differential diagnoses. Anything else? If if uh, the if there's white discharge seen on the mass, then it could be um the, an infection or. Okay, uh, so that's separate. Okay, so that's separate. That's in addition to the mass. Okay, so those are the so differential diagnoses you should know. Risk factors you should know. Classification systems you should know. Okay, then um, uh, how will you manage prolapse? You should know. So if this, like this patient, we talk about directly removing the uterus and repair. Um, if there is a younger patient. About, could you tell more should... about, before we go to management, could you tell more about risk factors? Like we only okay. know if... Okay, so tell me the risk factors that you know. Of. What is the main risk factor in this age group? In this age group... Um, what is the main contributor in a woman, especially postmenopausal woman who develops a prolapse? In a postmenopausal, ma'am, it could be because of the heavy lifting, the physical labor. Okay. 
she doesn't uh, have heavy this patient see this she's para two living two she's had hospital deliveries everything seemed fine okay but why has she suddenly developed a prolapse in at 60 years of age i'm not sure ma'am anyone parity this lady is para two living two but yes you're right parity is a risk factor heavy work is a risk factor for instrumental delivery premature bearing down A chronic constipation, chronic cough; these are all um, risk factors. But in this patient, there doesn't seem to be any obvious risk factor. Why has she developed a prolapse? Ma'am, it could be because she um, it says it returned to um, physical labor at the time of perforation. Okay, but more than that, then she should have been at the prolapse long back. Why she? Um, if because um in a menopausal woman there could be estrogen deficiency. Very good. This is the answer I'm looking for. So the most common or the most obvious risk factor, in fact, the most common risk factor is hypoestrogenic state in the postmenopausal women that leads to laxity of the ligaments. Okay, and that very very commonly leads to prolapse. So being postmenopausal itself is a risk factor. Okay, and that is the most common risk. That is why you see most of these prolapses happening in the postmenopausal age group. Even if she is para two living or para three living three, and she has no other additional risk factors, you will find that in the postmenopausal age group, because of hypoestrogenism, the prolapse happens. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's an important risk factor. Now let's quickly go to management of a nulli paris prolapse, and then we'll end this. So suppose this lady was thirty year old and she had only one child. Okay, and she um, comes with. Then you do a sling surgery. If she wants, if okay, she so okay if for a female uh -huh. who wants future children, okay, so it depends on what she wants. Whether she wants childbearing or she doesn't want childbearing. So we have different kinds of sling surgeries. Okay, what else do we have? Ma'am, if the childbearing is complete, then you could go for a father gill surgery. Or if there is an increase in the uterus or whatever length, then again a father gill repair is indicated. Okay, nowadays what do we do? Ma'am, nowadays sling surgery. Using okay. anything else? Anything else we can do? So we have sling surgeries. We have, uh, uh, you're right. Sling surgeries we can do Manchester or for the gills repair if childbearing is not required and if there is cervical elongation. Okay, then we then these surgeries are indicated. But what is uh, what is done these days also is what is called a laparoscopic hysteropexy. What is a laparoscopic hysteropexy? Or a or a laparotomy and a hysteropexy. The the uh, root of surgery is immaterial. What is done is that the uterus is lifted up, okay, and it is sutured to the sacrum. So hystero means uterus and pexy means uh, fixing. So sacropexy, fixing the uterus to the sacrum. It's very similar to doing a ball. What is a ball prolapse, Nandini? Um, a wall prolapse is when they um, if a patient has a previous history of hysterectomy, then they'll they'll be apical suturing. So if that uh, uh, if there's that vaginal apical prolapse, then it's called wall. Yes. So that's so what is the treatment of wall prolapse? What is the gold um, standard treatment? Uterosacral suspension. Yes. So it is of what of the vault, right? So it's called the. Yes. Called a sacrocolpopexy. So the yes, same thing is done if the uterus is there. It's called a sacrohistropexy. The same okay. thing can be done, but with a intact uterus. So the cervix is actually hitched to the sacrum behind, so that lifts up the uterus, and that is what is being done very commonly these days instead of the sling surgeries and the Manchester for the gill. The histro sacrohistropexies are becoming more and more common. So you should mention that also. In your list of surgeries for nulli paris prolapse, okay. Um, I, I, I have end. a question. Ma yeah, tell me. Uh, uh, Ma'am, what is the difference between performing a sling surgery and um, the Shirodkar modification of Man Manchester surgery? Because in that, the only difference I found was that the um, the cervical amputation is removed. So if that's not, that's the same as sling. You're just Okay, so even I'll have to read up this. <laughs> even I've forgotten because Manchester for the gill right survival, so like a amputation is done, but um, Ashley Rodkar's modification I need to read. Anyone is there to help me can help me. I'll have to read and get back. And the know. only thing that was there in the textbook okay. is that the Shirodkar modification, just the step two is performed, not the step one. So cervical okay. amputation is not done. So I'll what is the difference? You. I thought like I'll get I'll I'll get back to you on this. Okay. Th thank you, ma'am. Okay. Any any other doubts? 
so these are these are things which even we don't commonly see in clinical practice okay so that's why we also need to read up on these topics there are certain things which uh, when you see every day or day in and day out you are very used to okay but some things are rare and uh, i need to get back on those ma'am before okay. you um, before yeah. we end the session could you please yeah. make like a checklist for everyone like what you expect from this case for mbbs okay students? all right so if we talk about a checklist first of all um, i do not know uh, about colleges so uh, i have worked in medical colleges in the south and in the north and um, one m- major difference i have noticed is in the south and even i did my undergraduate from the south so uh, we were always uh, given a short gynae case when i came to the north in delhi and ncr here a uh, gynae case is not a part of the university exam in fact uh, they just give a short a written case is that the same everywhere i mean is that also is is it still being done in the south and then are you still getting cases in the university exam gynae case yes ma'am yes ma'am like my seniors had uterine prolapse okay. case they were okay, given so, the so, patient for both yeah so in undergraduate from the south uh, colleges especially so i did my undergraduate from karnataka so there we were given short gynae cases but in delhi uh when i came here and i was practicing here here um, uh we just give a written case scenario so it differs number one wherever whoever is listening to this you are find out what what is the rule role, uh, what is the rules in your university exam but if you are given a short gynae case prolapse is one of the most common cases which is given to be taken in the exam and if you have to have a checklist okay so in history so as i said prolapse is a very straightforward uh, thing in the history you need to of course know the age know the uh, uh, risk factors i already mentioned all the risk factors so the name the negative history you have to mention all the risk factors history of if she is post menopausal history of post menopausal bleeding is very very important because that should raise alarm bells of any other associated pathology okay then um, uh, her parity her obstetric history is very important because all these are risk factors for prolapse okay and um, uh, so prolapse usually the history will be very straight forward there will be a mass per vaginum for many many months or years which is gradually worsening with size always ask for urinary complaints okay because they are always always associated uti is very common incomplete evacuation is common stasis of urine is common frequency is common and sui so incontinence is very common because that will be part of your treatment plan okay when it comes to examination always you'll always do a complete examination okay go in order don't miss abdominal examination because a large mass can also be a cause of the prolapse so don't don't just miss it out you have to examine the abdomen it's very very important when it comes to local examination you're not expected to do a per speculum or a per vaginum or uh, but try to do the thumb finger test okay when you see the exam see the prolapse to a local examination lift the prolapse or sometimes the cervix will be underneath you will not be able to see it just on seeing it so just wear gloves and lift the prolapse and examine it but you're not expected to do a per speculum examination so you will describe as randani described a pink globular mass okay out, outside the introitus if the cervix is there mention it okay and i ask her to cough look for sui which is a very good point that she did okay and um, uh, but of course you, you without doing a per speculum you can't comment on whether it is cystocele rectocele enterocele what is it so you end by saying your differential your that your diagnosis is that of a utero vaginal prolapse and i would like to do a per speculum examination before the examiner asks you need to i would like to do a per speculum examination to determine what um uh, the what compartment or what component is prolapsed out okay so that's how you should and you it, a prolapse if it's very obviously you won't have differentials so you don't have to say it's a differential diagnosis you can just say a provisional diagnosis or my diagnosis is uterovaginal prolapse okay is this clear yes ma'am okay so uh, briefly so this is actually a very straightforward case prolapse you don't really need a checklist for this but yes uh, this is a good point only for our future case presentations um, which i will tell you what is essential in both obstetric and gynae cases so you should note that down all of you should note that down okay so common questions asked i told you from the history risk factors will be asked differentials for mass per vaginum will be asked causes of what, what uh, also they can ask you on decubitus ulcer they can ask you on causes of bleeding in a prolapse okay then when it comes to examination they will ask you how will you examine what is thumb finger test how will you do a speculum examination what will you see okay and uh, then it will obviously come to differential diagnosis and management okay so management is very straightforward 
uh, if she's uh, uh, family is complete, if she is postmenopausal, then surgical management is the norm. Okay, uh, conservative management only if surgery is to be avoided. And uh, nullipyrus prolapse, you should have some idea about these different kinds of surgeries. Okay.